welcome to the stage, Mariel Conception, MD, owner and CEO, Big Trees MD. So as you guys are trickling back in, again, this is a speaker not to be missed. Our next speaker is Dr. Regan Stigman. She is a double board certified active duty flight surgeon in the United States Air Force stationed at the US Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Over the past decade, Dr. Stigman has proudly served in many leadership roles in a variety of nationally and internationally recognized medical platforms. We are thrilled to have her join us this afternoon as she discusses how to adopt more proactive uh, excuse me, more proactive approaches to healthcare through the lens of lifestyle and performance medicine because we have the time to do it. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Regan Stigman. Hello, hello. Hint 2022. Hello to you all. It is my absolute pleasure to be here on this stage in front of you. The uh, blinding lights help uh, with the nerves, so uh, I can hardly see any of you. Uh, but that's not the point of the exercise. Uh, the point of the exercise today is that I am your three o'clock shot of espresso. I have about half the energy of the sun. And uh, I'm just excited to loop you all in to a, a little flavor difference uh, in medicine and care delivery. And today we're going to be talking about biohacking the military's best and using lifestyle and performance medicine to not only optimize health of the Department of Defense, but to restore our national security. So without further ado, I'm going to lay down the foundations for what we're going to discuss today. One, the biggest problem that the DOD has, which is a superbly high chronic disease burden and how that becomes a threat to national security. The second is creating the DOD's most practical solution to that problem, which is lifestyle and performance medicine, human performance optimization and disease prevention treatment and reversal. Finally, we're gonna wrap it up with a little bit of the activation phase of conferences like this and the whole MO and the modus operandi of why we have events like this in an activated space and how everybody here can help contribute in some form or fashion to their own growth, uh, personally, professionally, for their patients, you name it. So for the phonetically inclined, yes, I am Dr. Reagan Stigman. It is a very Belgian and Teutonic name. And yes, my call sign actually is the Stig. And yes, I have the lead foot to match. But what is a flight surgeon? Uh, well, I, I fly around in KC-10s, mastering my uh, surgical craft, trying to mitigate turbulence. That's not what I do at all. Misnomer, just like the Surgeon General is not a surgeon. I am an aerospace medical professional. I specialize in primary care delivery, occupational health, preventive medicine, and lifestyle medicine, what we will discuss today. Ooh, hopefully this is showing up a little better for y'all. Um, just a little bit of my background. Um, I've spent the last half decade at the Air Force Academy on active duty. Um, I am fresh out, 30 days a civilian, um, after 11 years in service. So it's been an interesting, an interesting ride. Thank you very much. And I do want to give my, uh, my graces to my, my fellow brothers, sisters, and human beings in arms who I've had the, the pleasure of meeting over the past 24 hours. Um, it's really comforting to know that you're in this space as well, because it really matters, representation across the board. Um, I deployed last year to the United Arab Emirates as a squadron medical element flight surgeon. I'm double board certified in preventive medicine and lifestyle medicine. And um, I've been living and breathing in the space of the DOD for the last decade plus. And this is why I'm here today to give you a little bit of flavor of why military medicine and human performance optimization, and why does it matter to you, an audience of DPC in particular? Well, first of all, we, we know that you have to start with identifying a problem. And boy, howdy, do we have a large one in the Department of Defense. Does anybody in the crowd know somebody in their life who's a part of the military? Show of hands. Very good, that's almost everybody. Does anybody here uh, love somebody in the military maybe? Okay, yes, yeah, same, same set of hands, right? Why do I say, why should you love this person? Well, there's research from 2016 that shows 
that essentially we recruit the healthiest young, young men and women in this country into the military. We let them serve, separate, or retire, cross-match to their civilian counterparts. Veterans are the unhealthiest Americans in this country. I'm gonna say that again. As a veteran, I am now part of the most unhealthy demographic in this country. Why? What has happened to me in my last 11 years of professional career and professional career in service? Something has happened. Well, as the good old DOD likes to do, we put together instructionals, Air Force instructionals for my line of uh, service in the Air Force, obviously. This is the document that governs my professional space. As a flight surgeon, I am supposed to be delivering the equivalent of human performance optimization, enhancement, and sustainment. But as many folks know, when you have an instructional, those instructions don't always get followed. So we came to a uh, pretty stark reality in the DOD and that is the insanely high burden of chronic disease that we face and that we see and that is only continuing to grow every single year. And you can imagine what the pandemic did to uh, rates of chronic disease as well. Uh, we have high sedentary rates, particularly in newer branches like the Space Force. We have um, unhealthy consumption of substance, uh, caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, you name it. And we have notably poor patterns for health consumption and nutrient consumption. We have pretty bad habits in the DOD. So we're gonna do a little interactive session here, and it's gonna be based on this CDC publication from 2021, and it's gonna take a little bit of audience participation, so please don't be shy in yelling out answers to what you think the DOD spends annually on obesity-related health sequelae, on tobacco and tobacco causing or uh, side effects of tobacco use for health and musculoskeletal injury. Okay, first, here we go. Don't, don't be shy. It's not a time for being shy right now. Okay, what number do you think we as taxpayers spend annually on obesity and obesity related health concerns in the DOD annually? Let me hear it. Oh, you guys are smart. 1.5 billion. Okay, this is going to involve some public math, so keep that in mind. Okay, here we go. Advancing on. What do you think we spend in the DOD on tobacco? Yell it, yell it, please. Close, close, here we go, 1.8 billion. And here is the kicker. Musculoskeletal injuries, which was mentioned previously on this stage. Anybody have a sense, an idea? Close, 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 here we go, 3.7 billion. And that's, these are probably general underestimates to be fair, but you know, we have to do research and we only have select sites of data. Um, so moving on, what are we looking at? We are looking at a total of 7 billion underestimated that we're spending on largely preventable medical conditions in the DOD, and this is just three of them. So let's do some extrapolation and some public math. If you wanna go ahead and say, my time in service, we are spending over the course of a decade $70 billion on largely preventable health-related issues pertaining to overweight obesity, tobacco use, and musculoskeletal injuries. Note, I didn't even include alcohol consumption, which costs a balmy $1.1 billion, probably an underestimation as well. So to put it lightly, and in a nutshell, Houston, we have a problem, but not one that has yet been addressed. So here, true to form, is our biohack number one. When you, as a little old captain, identify a problem in a big, large enterprise like the DOD, you gotta come up to the table, acknowledge this, the problem itself, but you also have to come up with a solution. So what did we do? Well, we came with the data. We went to big leadership. We went to two MAGCOM commanders at the United States Air Force Academy, and we said, hey, we've got an issue. We know this is an issue. We know that health is not made in the clinic. You see that little teeny tiny percentage at the bottom? 10% of human health is derived from medical care, which means 90% of it is driven outside of medical care. So your lifestyle, your behavior, your social environments, your environmental exposures, social determinants of health, uh, if you want to think of it that way. And this was a big kicker that came out in the Lancet 2019, showcasing that poor diet in this country has now overtaken tobacco use as the number one leading cause of death and disability. So when you think about how we truly have an impact every single day and theoretically three times a day with what we're eating in this country and as individuals, 
That is the big crux for how we can truly impact our health, the health of our patients, and society at large with this ever burgeoning medical uh, issue for chronic disease that is just adding up and adding up over time. So this is the sad reality that we see projected over time. And um, this is not new. We know that overweight and obesity contributes to all of these medical conditions downstream. Why? There's tons of dysregulation, uh, gut microbiota, hormonal changes that happen with extra um, central adiposity, things of that nature. Also, this statistic that is now 21 years old that shows we take nearly two decades to update how we as practitioners actually practice. Something to think about. Well, uh, I put this slide in here because it gives you some pause as professionals in the healthcare space. What I like to show and uh, really just highlight as a sociocultural component of um, what doctors and nurses were doing in the 1940s and 50s. They were endorsing smoking. I don't know that you would meet a practitioner today who would uh, promote actively uh, camels or uh, other kinds of cigarettes for issues like anxiety, um, you know, how, how you're going to address health conditions with uh, lifestyle choices. What was the faux pas of the medical generation prior to mine? Uh, is physicians and the like promoting smoking? What is the faux pas, I believe, of our professional generation? Is that we have not been educated sufficiently in how to counsel our patients, let alone ourselves, uh, on how to intelligently integrate lifestyle practices into fruition for ourselves and for our patients. So uh, we've got the uh, hockey great legend here, Wayne Gretzky, who uh, sadly those Oilers just fell to the uh, avalanche in a sweep. I didn't want to bring it up, but I had to. So uh, really um, taking this advice to heart, do not skate to where the puck is going, or rather do, please, sorry. Yep, skate to where the puck is going, not where it has been. And why does that matter? Because by and large, how we were trained in this country, in our medical schools, in our nursing programs, in any allied healthcare position for training, you are taught how to manage disease. You are not taught that, hmm, there are root causes of medical issues and chronic conditions. Seven of the top 10 leading killers of Americans, first line of defense, intensive therapeutic lifestyle change. Were we taught that in our professional education classes? By and large, the answer is no. But I will tell you, we have now an answer coming to the table for a root cause analysis of how we can truly address chronic disease. And that is through lifestyle medicine, or what we in the military call lifestyle performance medicine. So true to form, there is a national medical college, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They've got a booth here. Uh, Charlotte's running it, fantastic. You can learn more, talk to them, phenomenal. This has been the underpinning of the success that we have had changing the tune of healthcare delivery in the Department of Defense for the last decade of my career in it. So lifestyle medicine, in a nutshell, I tell my patients it's a pentad plus one. Your health is comprised of what you eat, how you move, how you sleep, how you think, how you regulate stress, and how you mitigate risky substance use with a huge focus on what you eat. Why? Because The Lancet told us now, three years ago, that it is poor diet that is what is contributing to morbidity and mortality in this country at a rate now surpassing tobacco use. So in a nutshell, you're going to eat things that have more fiber in them, like plants and fruits and nuts and whole grains. You're going to move. You're going to get restorative sleep. You're going to be smart about how you manage your stress. You're going to make social connections. You're going to avoid risky substance use, and you're going to make positive social connections. This discussion, I hope to land on each and every single one of you as uh, people who are already in that phase of change professionally. You are all in the space of dir direct primary care, and I envision this union of lifestyle medicine as sort of a level up or a version 2.0 of how you can successfully further achieve health for your patients and for yourselves as practitioners. This is a remarkable way to um, activate um, burnout mitigation and uh, recapturing why you went into the medical world in the first place. So the beauty part of lifestyle medicine is that it really highlights the idea that your genes are not your destiny. Your genes load the gun but your choices in life and your lifestyle habits pull the trigger. One of my favorite quotes, 
Humans do not determine their future. Humans determine their habits, and their habits determine their future. So something to think about. With respect to epigenetic regulation, you're turning good genes on, you're turning bad genes off. With respect to the gut microbiota, you are maintaining a state of inflammation or de-inflammation in your body. This is pretty straightforward science. This isn't anything, you know, blow, blow you out of the water, knock your socks off. This is just the essence and that six-pillar system of lifestyle medicine and how to achieve uh, the end results, which are health, go figure. Uh, we're in the medical world. We're hoping to shift away from disease management into health maintenance. I tell my patients very bluntly, I want this to be the trajectory of your life. Healthy, 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 dead. Some people find that comical. Some people are like, whoa, who is this lady? But also, you know, we talk about, I want my patients to die as late in life as young as possible. And I think that is the cadence that we need to have and we need to be delivering in every form and fashion for professional care delivery. So when you talk about accountability in this space of how we're going to get to that strategic pivot point of integrating lifestyle medicine into something like a, a DPC or into whatever kind of healthcare you're delivering, you have to find that synergy, hint, great example, great partnership for bringing together forward-leaning individuals who are already in that space of change, doing something out of the ordinary. And here you have the opportunity to stack up and tag on an extra component that's gonna give you high return on investment and your patients high return on investment. Also, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has mentioned um, many military entities, the Consortium for Health and Military Performance. They've helped us grow. They've helped us gain traction in the DOD to help fix a broken system and to help fix broken soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, coast guardsmen, guardians, you name it. Um, and not to mention, um, when you talk about human performance optimization for our warfighters, this catches on pretty rapidly in our partner nation status. NATO is after this. We're heading to Lithuania to train cadets uh, in the military academy on how to be healthier, how to, how to optimize their health uh, and their performance through the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. So the second biohack that we're gonna land on today is speaking things into existence. This is a photo of one of my patients uh, it, on the right. And uh, she, uh, after implementing the lifestyle changes, she actively put her diabetes into remission. She dropped 100 points of cholesterol and she lost 10 pounds. Simple. And what matters here? We, we, we care about longevity and sustainability. The, the woman to my right in this photo, that is the Surgeon General of the Air Force. That's uh, General Dorothy Hogg. So I pitched this to General Hogg and said, hey ma'am, you're telling us active duty flight surgeons to deliver human performance optimization, but we're not following through on what you're asking in these Air Force instructionals. So we really need to follow through. We need to not just put um, nice papers on a table and say, hey, all flight surgeons, you do this. We need to show up and we need to say, hey, this is the consensus of care delivery, not just in the military side of the house, but on the civilian side of the house as well. You have the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists, the AHA, the ADA, American Dietetics, you name it. Everyone is promoting and saying, this is the first line of defense and how we should be delivering care at every single visit in every single patient interaction. Another quick snapshot just for some real life context that I will... Uh, not rub salt in the wound zone, but really just to highlight, this is nearly what every single military base looks like. And this is from the Air Force Academy, pre-pandemic, I might add, where we have nearly 2,000 active duty personnel, excluding all cadets. Nearly 70% of that active duty population has one or more of the following chronic conditions. Overweight, obese, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, prediabetes, or diabetes type two. This does not particularly look like the picture of uh, primed national security, does it? How are you supposed to carry a ruck uh, in the middle of the desert when there's temperatures above 100 degrees and you're going to be expected to perform uh, cognitively, physically, you name it? This is the problem that we're facing now in 2022. So, Plato said it best here, our need will be the real creator. And so we came to the table with not only a problem, but we came with a solution. And thus, lifestyle and performance medicine was born in the DOD in 2019. 
So what is lifestyle and performance medicine? Well, in a nutshell, it's essentially lifestyle medicine, but with an extra tactical flair because you have to militarize everything. You know, I, I say you slap a coat of uh, camouflage and you put a little tank and a bomb, whatever you need to militarize, and it becomes something more military-like. So that's what lifestyle performance med is. The additional component of LPM is the human performance optimization angle. So not only are we preventing, treating, and reversing chronic disease in populations across the board from recruitment to retirement, but we are sustainably optimizing their physiology to perform at their maximum capacity during deployments, when they're in garrison as well, so that they're ready to go. They're not just ready to deploy, they're optimized to deploy. So luckily, uh, being in the world of preventive medicine, it's a small world in the military, uh, I had a very motivated set of individuals who were helping me conceptualize how we get to pitch this to the big brass. So we created a document, and of course, you know, if you want anything to get teeth or to, to gain traction, you have to have missions, visions, objectives, how you're going to get to where you're going to get, and you need people with power to sign off on that. So we created the mission and the vision of the United States Air Force Lifestyle Performance Medicine Work Group. And of course, here it is in a nutshell. We want allied healthcare professionals to come together to infuse the, the essence of lifestyle medicine plus human performance optimization within the military health systems population and clinical practice. This needs to be the standard of care for all professionals and, and healthcare personnel. And the vision being that medical providers who are trained in lifestyle medicine need to be leading the charge in this space um, for optimization, re readiness, and health in general. So what we did was build a charter. And this charter hosts, you can't read those, that's too bad, uh, seven lines of effort that essentially focus on how to introduce professionals to lifestyle and performance medicine, how you can strategically collaborate Think of a patient-centered medical home model. Uh, if my uh, MA or my nurse or my PA are speaking the same language that I'm speaking to all my patients, we're going to have more successful touch points and more sustained health outcomes. Uh, education, research, policy and advocacy, grassroots initiatives, and then the biggest beast of them all, how do we build an active culture of health in the Department of Defense that is notorious for having and hosting a culture of bad habits? So what do you also have to do as you waltz through growing and building a completely novel concept and idea work group and pitching it to uh, your senior leadership, all four four-star generals, um, leaders who would sign on to this document, endorse it, and then make that a mandate and give us free reign to start executing on these lines of effort. You have to not only hunt the good, but you have to celebrate the wins along the way. So what I have, and what we've continually shown to leadership uh, through not just uh, paperwork, but also how it's impacting our patients, is what lifestyle medicine has the true capacity to do. And that is listed along that left-hand side. You get improved health in your patient populations, absenteeism drops, uh, increased engagement, excitement. Patients actually like coming to the doctor's office. And if you know flight medicine, you know that anybody who is a flyer turns the opposite direction when they see a flight surgeon because you don't want to jeopardize your opportunity to fly. You improve your focus, your energy goes up, your creativity improves, you have fewer accidents at work, and you're more productive as a member of society or the DOD. So what we ended up building, and I don't expect you to read this, is an 11-page document that captured our successes over the course of the last three years, uh, pandemic aside, uh, for those seven lines of effort. So for example, we have lifestyle and performance medicine instilled at 19 clinics now worldwide. Uh, the very first started at the Air Force Academy in 2017. That is progress if you know how slow the DOD adapts to anything. We have over 50 publications that have gone out in conjunction from all walks of the healthcare professional setting. Um, and we have significant GME or graduate medical education initiatives that have launched. We're integrating lifestyle medicine residency curriculum within eight military GME programs as it stands now. And um, we're helping to pave the path, as mentioned, for our international allies to follow suit for um, meeting the mark for human performance optimization and uh, lifestyle medicine in general. 
So in a nutshell, I'm hoping to relay to all parties here today why it's so valuable to find ways to unite your craft of DPC and maybe add an extra level of flair to it, uh, that being lifestyle medicine. And so this is uh, Dr. Melissa Mandala, who I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, she is in DPC. She's also a lifestyle medicine specialist as well. So just you know, showing that you're not going to be the first, which is kind of a nice thing when you feel like, oh, well, how many people are actually doing this? How many people are weaving in lifestyle medicine? Do I need to get certified? How is it impacting their DPC delivery? So it's already being done is the bottom line up front here. And not to mention, there is significant buy-in happening, as you can note from the uh, time frame of this publication. So this is the Journal of Family Practice. They're showcasing how you can integrate lifestyle medicine into the most common problems. So metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, neurologic diseases such as dementia and Alzheimer's. Obviously, the QR code is there for you to snap so you can see what I'm talking about. Just some preliminary foundations for how you can wet your whistle on what lifestyle medicine might look like in your clinic or into your practice. So once again, why is it so essential to unite accountability partnerships here like we have everybody in front of us? One, uh, the networking piece. I'm, I'm proud to say that um, during my time in service, I was also lucky enough to join one of the local medical schools, and I teach as the director of digital health. And I do want to thank the HINT team once again for being smart enough to open this opportunity to medical students and residents. Because the younger that you are exposed to these kinds of unconventional approaches to medicine, the better of a chance you stand at dedicating your full career to changing the true path of how you want to experience medicine. Uh, it shouldn't have to be 10 years after you've uh, graduated from residency. You should know about these opportunities like DPC, like lifestyle medicine, like functional medicine. You should know about them in medical school so that you can make educated decisions as you go forward in your professional lives. So once again, it's essential to know where our accountability partners are and where they lie. So here's the final discussion point here. How can you step up to the proverbial table? Whether or not it's integration for further advancing lifestyle and performance medicine in the DOD or the VA, maybe you're a strategic partner. Maybe you see a, a, a significantly higher number of VA patients. Maybe you have some connection. Maybe you know somebody. Uh, the point of this here is to unite what talents you all have, which are incredible. I had the, the great pleasure of meeting so many uh, novel thinkers last night at the Mixer, and I can only imagine what uh, the, the slate of 400 plus attendees looks like uh, at large. Um, if it's something to do with, you're doing research that's touching on one of those six pillars of lifestyle medicine, that counts. We're trying to get critical mass to continue showing the value add of lifestyle med or lifestyle and performance med across the board. Uh, maybe you have the opportunity to collaborate with military or civilian institutions where you are in your practice. Um, CME, educational opportunities like this one, uh, great opportunity to get the word out about what potential options exist, how you can get certified, how you can get further educated on lifestyle medicine. So my ask to all of you is figure out how you can get further involved in this and what does that look like? Does that mean you yourself look farther into what lifestyle medicine is all about? Does that mean, okay, you're just going to eat a couple more carrots today at dinner? That, that counts. You know, we go with small steps and small wins uh, for the, these efforts here. Um, does that mean you're going to get moving? You're going to manage your stress more effectively? You're going to carve out your time for yourself as the healthcare professional? Uh, that was very astutely noted is that we all too frequently do not carve out that time for ourselves as professionals. Um, as mentioned, you could get more education. You can reach out to the team ACLM here at the booth. You can look what certifications might look like. Um, you can find those collaborative uh, opportunities to unite yourselves, other colleagues who might be familiar with things like integrative medicine or functional med, learning the difference between the two of them or all of them. And then accountability. This is truly the opportunity to give patients a different and a new choice. And I'm excited to share with you one of my favorite patient testimonials here in just a minute. So the integration of lifestyle medicine will mean truly nothing to you unless you test pilot it for yourself. 
Lifestyle medicine is not all or nothing, it's all or something. So I encourage you to find that sweet spot for yourself. Help your patients find that sweet spot as well. Help them realize that your health is an investment, not an expense. And of course, I wouldn't be a very good uh, local Denver native if I didn't give you some fantastic food, exercise, art opportunities to capitalize on. So go check out City O City or Somebody People or Wellness Sushi. Those are plant-forward restaurants, remarkable. You will not be able to tell that your food has been adapted to de-inflame your body. It's, it's brilliant what they're doing. Meow Wolf is awesome, Museum of Contemporary Art. Get out, run the Cherry Creek Trail. Hopefully you're gonna go up to Red Rocks and enjoy the show up there. Um, do the stairs when you get up there. Get really sweaty before the show, and then think of uh, how you're hitting the mark for your physical activity for the day. So we're gonna launch right into the uh, patient presentation, or the case study, rather, uh, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. And this is one of my favorite cases to discuss, and I think uh, Brene Brown said it best, that maybe stories are just data with a soul. And I think when you apply the reality of a human life and um, how a human life's career trajectory has changed to a reality for health, and particularly something that has the capacity to be prevented and treated, it really um, hits home. So this is one of my patients from 2019, Major Leroy Jackson. And of course, he gives me permission to share his story. He was an EO, or an executive officer, up at the, uh, he's out at Shaw Air Force Base now, but he was uh, Air Ops Command up at the Academy. He came in, saw me in 2019 for his first lifestyle performance med consult. And sadly, Major Jackson's uh, biological parameters looked very similar to almost every single flyer that I had come through my shop. His BMI was bordering obesity, his bad cholesterol was 223 at the tender age of 35. Uh, he was overweight, and this is the big kicker, and this is what shocked me. That day that he came into my clinic, we did the standard lab panel, A1C, lipids, uh, you name it, pretty basic. But I had to diagnose Major Jackson with diabetes after, of course, confirming A1C uh, on another measurement. I had to diagnose arguably one of the healthiest of the healthy members in the United States military with type 2 diabetes. That does not sound like the picture of health for uh, national security or for a flyer who's going to be flying million dollar aircrafts or navigating them or helping to steer them. So we had an issue on our hands and that's okay because we know how to solve issues. Here is a quick snapshot of Major Jackson's initial disease burden. At the age of 35, he was overweight, almost obese. He was hypertensive, he was hyperlipidemic. He was type two diabetic based on A1C. He had impaired insulin resistance. He was fatigued, he had no energy, his sleep was poor, he had brain fog all day long. And the kicker for everybody in uniform, he was no longer able to deploy. I had to pull him off of his deployment with four weeks notice because you can't send somebody who is an unmanaged type 2 diabetic downrange for fear of complications of a health condition. So that puts somebody else in a short change spot, but we had a game plan. And I gave Major Jackson some options. I said, hey, we can treat you with standard medicine. I can medically manage you with pills. It's gonna be a little bit longer to uh, figure out how to get your blood sugar stabilized. We can treat you with pills or we can treat you with plants. And he said, you know what, Doc Stig, I have heard so many of my colleagues come in, sit down, talk to you, and all I have to do is just give it a shot. What's going to happen? The worst thing that happens is things get worse. Maybe. I'll give it a shot. I'm going to try the Dr. Stig seven-day plant-based challenge. So what did Major Jackson do for 168 hours, which is seven days? He just ate real food. He didn't eat uh, processed foods, he didn't eat a bunch of fruit roll-ups, he cut back, if not fully eliminated, uh, animal products, dairy, uh, things that, foods that come, are source, sourced from animal products, cheeses, eggs, just cut back on that, ate a plant-based diet for seven days. In seven days, he dropped his LDL cholesterol 55 points, but something more incredible started happening over seven days only. He came back nearly screaming into my office with abundant energy saying, I'm just gonna go ahead and keep going with this weird program you have me on, Doc, because I've never felt so good. 
So he does. He keeps going. Another 14 days passes. He drops another 28 points of bad cholesterol just because he's eating real food. Go figure. He drops a total of 83 points of bad cholesterol in 14 days. Major Jackson continues on this track for six weeks, which turns into six months, which now turns into nearly three years. Major Jackson was also experiencing what we in the biz like to call the upward spiral. So instead of that, you know, laundry list of side effects that you hear after every Super Bowl commercial, none of which you want, uh, he was experiencing the exact opposite of that. He was losing weight, his energy was increased, his cholesterol was improving and normalizing, his headspace was clar clarifying, he would no longer had brain fog. His stronger, his exercise stamina was increased. He could do more reps. He could recover faster. And his sleep quality improved. Also, this started happening. This is what happens when you remove the gunk from the machinery of our pancreas that generates insulin and what happens to insulin regulation in our bodies. Once you optimize the human system and the metabolic system for uh, Healing. Go figure. We are, hu we are humans. We are built not only to heal, but we're built to perform. So what's happening in this situation? Well, he is actively putting his diabetes type 2 into remission. After sticking to what he claims to me is an 89% plant-based diet over the last two and a half years now, Major Jackson has returned to deployment status. He's lost over 35 pounds sustainably. His blood pressure is normalized. His LDL cholesterol is now below 120 points, which means he's dropped over 100 points of LDL cholesterol. Once again, his diabetes is in remission. He does not need to be medically managed for any of this because he's doing it by himself. And that's the beauty part of activating your patients. His new goal now is to normalize his A1C, get out of that pre-diabetic zone. He's also appreciating that mitigated brain fog. His energy levels are skyrocketing again, and he sustains his ability to exercise and to pass his PT tests. So I think this is the biggest kicker is that one, we're still not teaching medical students that you can put diabetes into remission. You can get rid of it. Thank you for sharing today. I forget the gentleman's name, but he mentioned he put his own di diabetes type two into remission as well. This needs to be the cadence of delivery and the cadence of discussion at every med school course of metabolic uh, discussion and diabetes, pre-diabetes, you name it. Why are we not teaching the next generation of medical professionals that this is possible? That putting hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, uh, diabetes, um, potentially even cardiovascular disease, you can reverse what's, what's happening in your body if you dial in what's happening in your daily habits. So, Without, you know, continuing, continuing on uh, as I could with so many patients who have walked into the world of lifestyle and performance medicine and have been just excited to have a new opportunity in front of them and a, and a medical professional who gave them that opportunity but who led it. I stand as the quarterback. They're my wide receivers. Nobody looks good unless I make a nice catch and I make a nice pass and they catch it in the end zone. So that's how you succeed and that's how you score as a team. And we could not have done this work in the DOD without the help of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So I do urge you to check out the college, see if getting certified is right for you, see if you can augment how you approach those six tenets of lifestyle medicine, um, see what you can dial in, see how you can biohack your best. And with that, I will happily open the floor to questions. Uh, the, the question was, have we talked to the powers that be about TRICARE uh, and collaborating? And we've got Jay in the audience, right? We had a little discussion. So, you know, we're working on that, and that's a great point. And to that end, and I was uh, having a good laugh with um, Dr. Mark and uh, Stacy last night about if you really want to get something done in the military, you got to go to your congressman and congresswomen and get those bills passed because that's where, that's where the money is, and that's where the rubber meets the road for getting change in the DOD. So that is our next step, and that is my hope, is to link uh, lifestyle medicine and these forward-leaning health maintenance efforts into the DOD for exactly that reason. Great point. Have studies been done about the quality of meat? 
that is being consumed. Can you speak up, please? Can studies, have studies been done about the quality of meat consumed? About the quality of? Of meat uh, that's being consumed, like grass-fed or? Ah, good question. Um, there have been some studies done, uh, and I would have to point you to that direction. And you're asking about the difference between uh, conventionally raised uh, animal husbandry versus grass-fed. Yes. There have been studies in that space, um, and there is a uh, somewhat slighter inflammation profile in uh, grass-fed animals, uh, but it's inflammation nonetheless. So good answer. Good question, rather. So it seems to me like warfighters should be considered like NCAA Division One athletes. And then if we, the public, are going to support people's health care for the rest of their lives in the DOD, their supporters of the warfighters should probably be treated like that too. And then if we, the public, are going to pay for Medicare for everyone for the rest of their life, it seems like we should all put all of this into all of us, including DPC doctors who are trying to escape, you know, so that we can actually take care of ourselves. Because if we die early, we each leave hundreds or thousands of patients without physicians to help them through this. That requires a lot of investment up front for a payoff later. Is there any ideas on how to convince congressmen or healthcare networks, providers, organizations on why this investment is gonna pay off later? Well, uh, that's a remarkable question, and I'd, I'd like to contend that, um, you remember that $70 billion number that's going to add up in another 10 years? Even if we asked uh, Congress for 10% of that, and we said, hey, uh, let us invest this, this money up front. Let's spend $1 now to save $5.60 down the road. Uh, because there's been proven time and again, uh, American Public Health Association, when you invest up front, you save on... Uh, chronic disease spending down the road. Um, I liked your comment too about, it's not just the warfighter, it's the warfighter and their families. And, and the families have to go through this every step of the way with the warfighter. And it has been also proven by RAND uh, that when the warfighter has a healthy family at home, that warfighter performs better downrange in theater. They're not concerned about how uh, their spouse might need emergency surgery or might go into DKA because they're mismanaged. Um, so once again, this comes down to talking to the leadership uh, at the big White House and talking to congressional representatives and saying, here's the data and here's why we need to invest now. So actively in process, but great point to bring up. Thank you. Hi, I practice lifestyle medicine as well in Kansas City. And my biggest barrier, patient's barrier, is always that you can give them instructions about all this, right? But they need a lot of support. So what, what are you, are you, you know, do you provide health coaching? Because we refer patients out for health coaching, dietitians and the works. But, you know, there's always that barrier. There's a financial strain, for one. And so I was just wondering what you, you guys use in the military for patients. Great point. And uh, once again, uh, we know that health is not made in the clinical visit Health is made in every step of the way uh, to include health coaches. We have military one source in the military, but it's even physicians knowing that that is an asset that they have to help their patients find ways to maximize health goals. Um, it's also making sure that your um, team, outside of just the physician's office, so your nutritionists, your dietitians, your physical therapists, um, your pharmacists even, that they're all speaking the same language because we know that there are a lot of um, antiquated, let's call them, ways of approaching health. Um, the uh, food pyramid, for example. Uh, interesting approach to health in this country uh, when you know uh, what's subsidized and what isn't. And I think that's really important to pay attention to as well. So definitely collaborations with health coaches is essential. And um, I think that uh, we're, we're helping to move the needle on that for patients to realize that their health is every step in between. It's the white space. It's the space between the words um, during their, their annual visits. So great point to bring up. Mine is more a comment than a question. Um, there's a saying that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And so until you take the first step, whether as a provider, for as an example to your patients, or you get them the help they need, you know, today is, today is a new day. I love it. And I think living, breathing proof of that are uh, six of my students here from Rocky Vista University who are rising second year medical students. If you think about when you learned about something like DPC or lifestyle medicine, that should have happened in your first year of medical school. So 
do your duty as, as medical health professionals. Start reaching out to your local medical schools or training programs. Have that discussion. Be those advocates. Be that central mentor force to make those changes in the next generation of allied healthcare professional. All right. Thank you all so very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>